wildlife expert Jean Duplessis descends into one of Africa's great natural wonders. This is really like Eden. It's hard to imagine how it can really get better. The search is on for one of Africa's last great tuskers. I'm driving to an area of a huge amount of wildlife, and we're looking for the big bull elephant. He encounters a unique truce between two apex predators. The crater floor must be the ideal environment for hyenas. And then he journeys to a secret waterfall. It gets really busy around these falls, and it just gets more and more intense. particular wildlife ecosystem is not something that happens by chance. It develops over time, where everything in it evolves together, influenced by the weather, and shaped by the geography of the land. When these two elements work in harmony, the results can be spectacular. One of the best examples of this is in northern Tanzania. It has been called one of the greatest natural wonders on Earth. This is Ngorongoro. The Ngorongoro Highlands is a series of extinct volcanoes that once stood as high as Mount Kilimanjaro. A cataclysmic eruption two million years ago caused it to collapse, creating a massive crater 20 kilometers across and 600 meters deep that today is home to the highest concentration of mammals in the world. The volcano's outer slopes are covered by a thick montane forest that is home to a healthy population of elephants. Just by itself, Ngorongoro is spectacular, but it plays a far bigger role in the ecology of the area. To its north, in Gorongoro's major eruption buried the surrounding area in a thick layer of ash, creating the Serengeti Plains. The Ngorongoro's highlands act like a barrier, trapping the seasonal rains and turning what would otherwise be a dry and dusty plain into a lush green ecosystem that supports an incredible diversity of wildlife. But where it gives so generously to its north, it denies on the south. This is the Great Rift Valley. It's a massive scar caused by tectonic forces that are splitting Africa in two. It's home to many different animal species, including a healthy population of elephants. But in the dry season, the elephants all make their way inland to Lake Manyara and Tarangiri National Parks. Both are in Ngorongoro's rain shadow. Although the area does not get abundant rain, the Ngorongoro Highlands offer the southern land's water that trickles down from the mountains. That bit of water is a lifeline that sustains a small but rich and diverse ecosystem. Wildlife expert and safari guide John Duplessis is at Lake Manyara National Park. The water coming down these waterfalls behind me is a result of rain that falls up in the Ngorogoro Crater Highlands and then siphons through the ground and ends up in these streams that all rush out into Manyara. This is the point where this Enderbush River will disappear into the sand and continue down to the lake as an underground river. It's interesting to see here where the water disappears into the sand that it's like a minefield of elephant droppings. This clearly is the most favorable place for elephants to come and have a morning and a late afternoon drink. And the whole time during the day, we'll have different herds coming through. 
At the moment, we are in a bit of an in-between season where there's quite a bit of water coming down the falls, but as we're progressing into the dry season, the point where the water disappears will become closer and closer to the base of the waterfalls, up until where we get into the middle of September, October, where it's extremely dry, and the only thing we will have would be a tiny trickle of water coming down the rocks and a tiny puddle at the base of the waterfalls. It's now September and well into the dry season. The rains in the Ngorongoro Highlands have stopped and the waterfalls have been reduced to a trickle. Lake Maniera is beginning to dry up. Those falls become very important to wildlife in the park. This is more than likely a small group that came in here early evening to drink. Um, there's, there's lots of signs of tracks all over the place, which uh, tells me that different groups of elephants came in here during the evening. The water here must be some of the only water remaining in this Rift Valley system. It gets really busy around these falls uh, towards sunset, and where you have herds from all across this area meeting here and elephants don't generally do well of such a large congregation of different family groups there's a lot of tension and stress and it just gets more and more intense as the season gets dry it can create quite a stressful situation for elephants it's very loud very sensory so many females drinking at the falls that it attracts the attention of a male elephant that has come into must. And that adds another dynamic to an already tense situation. Must is a periodic condition that signals the elephant's intent to mate. Elephant males only go into must every 10 or 12 years. When they do, their behavior becomes erratic, even dangerous. Their testosterone level can be as high as 60 times normal levels. Even the most placid male becomes territorial and aggressive. Judging from his size, this elephant is about 40 years old. He's big enough to do more than a bit of damage if he's provoked. In elephants, the must phase doesn't make him more attractive to females. In fact, because of the aggression, the mom and baby decide to leave. It's just too dangerous to hang around. After a bit of showboating, he realizes the females are only interested in a drink, so he heads down river in search of another group. It's now October in Tanzania's Rift Valley, and it's several months into the dry season. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis has moved on to Tarangiri National Park. Several months without rain has caused many of the park's rivers to dry up. This is life in the rain shadow of the Ngorongoro Highlands. No rain will fall now for months, and the wildlife that lives in the area all pull in closer to the base of the highlands, where the few lakes and rivers are fed by water that trickles down from above. 
This river is the lifeline of Tarangiri National Park and especially now during the dry season when the surrounding areas are extremely dry it's like a magnet pulling in all sorts of animals and especially herds of elephants into the river. And what will generally happen would be in the early mornings, a family group like this would move into the river and have a drink, only to start to move out about now into the higher lying areas where there's more shade and cover, and then come back again late afternoon for another drink. Elephants have an extremely well-developed sense of smell. They can smell sources of water that are several miles away, and also water that is running below ground. Although there might be a little bit of surface water on the river right now, for most of the year, this river actually flows subterraneally. Elephants have evolved this great way to allow constant access to the water by digging big holes. I'm gonna just do a little dig here to see how deep the water actually is. And the deeper you go, you eventually start to access water. This time of year, an elephant does not need to work hard at all, but as the season dries out, they will have to dig bigger and bigger holes. And then as other animals come like zebras, the sides will fall in and it will become larger and larger. So eventually to have quite a nice pond and the water is a little bit dusty now, but in a few minutes, this water, the dust will settle and it will be very clear. This is the baobab tree, which is such an iconic feature on these dry African landscapes. And it's a tree that creates a lot of debate between scientists. Obviously looking so enormous, it must clearly be very old. Some scientists believe that it's, it's not that old, where it can only, only about 800 years of age, a big tree like this, um, where some others believe it, it's over 3,000 years old. The, the challenge with baobabs are that they haven't got any growth rings. The tree is actually hollow inside and um, very, very fibrous and actually quite soft. And generally soft wood trees will grow quite fast. These trees form the most incredible habitats for all sorts of animals, from insects all the way through to man. And um, it's commonly known that these hollow insides of boobabs have formed houses, hides, and even shops to some human communities. Out here in Tarangiri National Park, where this is probably one of the most common features of the park, it's home to baboons, leopards, uh, quite commonly occupied by an owl. The danger for these trees are when a severe drought might hit a system that elephants can actually completely destroy them. If too many elephants start to feed on it and use their tusks to break off pieces of tree, it will kill a tree. One can clearly see here how the, the bark has been ripped away by elephants and there's some tusk marks here where elephants will come in and put their tusks in and rip out pieces of this bark. Almost all other trees when the bark is stripped completely around the tree will die because nutrients cannot move up and down anymore. But baobabs are completely different where it's not dependent on an outside bark. These trees will continue to survive and that's a great feat to survive in an environment full of elephants. Terengiri's main river flows from the highlands, snaking its way through the park, ending in a series of swamps. I'm coming up onto Selali Swamps, which is one of the largest wetland systems in this greater Terengiri ecosystem. And the last refuge for family groups of elephants during these extreme dry seasons. And as I'm driving up on it, I can see various groups all scattered through the swamp. And as the system dries out, that, those numbers of elephants will just increase. Jean's trips to the swamp come to a full halt 
when he sees an irresistible baby elephant. around in the water. It's uh, interesting that none of the other elephants are in there and it's clearly having a fantastic time just rolling around, getting completely submerged. It's, uh, it's a really young baby, you know, younger than about, younger than a year. And um, it's just having an absolute ball. Younger than a year, and a, a good way to tell age at such young age is that they can fit under the belly of a mum. Uh, that's generally an indication of being younger than a year. This is really amazing all around me where there's herds of elephants everywhere, little family groups here. There's a group of 50 right around me and then all the way through the swamp, there's tiny family groups just making the swamp full of elephants. And it's, the younger ones are much more to the shoreline where it's not so deep, but all the way into the center of the swamp, one can see big males standing. And the only thing we can see of them are the ears flapping. And it's really the perfect place for an elephant to be right now. It's a lot to eat and a lot to drink, and it's very safe. One thing about Tanzania, it's just fantastic, is that you've got these endless corridors of especially animals like elephants that can move fairly undisturbed from areas as far as Ngorogoro Crater, coming through those montane forests into Lake Manyara and then can follow a corridor around Lake Manyara all the way into Tarangiri. So, in effect, the old bull could have really been born thousands of kilometers from here and slowly through his lifetime, made his way across and through these different corridors to end up in a place like this. Looking at this swamp with uh, 50 elephants here, another group on the far side, and basically all the way running north, just filled with elephants. It's hard to imagine how elephants can be endangered. Um, but the success of a species is really determined by the availability of an habitat during the dry season. Of course, there's a lot of areas for these elephants to go to when it's wet, but it's the protection of these areas that can give them or can guarantee them survival during the dry seasons that is very important to look after. And it's these microcosms such as Salali swamps, the crater floor, Serengeti plains, where elephants have a safe haven to go to when conditions get too harsh outside of parks. And harsh can mean many things. You know, in this case, it's dry, no water, but as human populations expand and it becomes harder for elephants to find that far safe refuge, this will be where it is into the future. southern side of Ngorongoro, the dry season runs from May through to October, when the short rains begin. The name doesn't refer to the amount of rain, but rather the season. 
the short rain season lasts only for a few months. And it very quickly brings an end to the dry season. All of last night I could hear loud thunder on top of the escarpment which clearly indicates massive amount of rain. And this river have a huge catchment area. This morning there was a tiny little trickle coming down the rocks but now it is steadily increasing to becoming huge currents and I expect this afternoon these rocks will be covered by water coming down off the highlands. After the pools at the base of the river fill, water begins to flow. At first as a trickle in the sand. As the water from the highlands begins to collect in the tributaries, the river suddenly swells, and within an hour, huge torrents of water arrive at the falls. elephants emerges from the forest. They have smelled the water. They know the river is flowing. It's been a long dry season for these elephants. For elephants, water is not only crucial for drinking, they also need it to take care of themselves. An elephant's skin is thick and requires the moisture to help keep it healthy. I'm sitting in our Manyara camp and this large group of elephants came down to drink at the river. And literally minutes before they arrived, this river flooded. And a river that had no water in this morning suddenly was full bank to bank. And it was quite interesting seeing the obvious joy in them to be going into the water and enjoying a late afternoon drink. As the water flows, it rejuvenates the land, the trees, and forests that so many other species depend on. This end of Bush River is by far the largest river flowing into Lake Manyara. This is Lake Manyara, and this is where all the water from the highlands eventually end up in. This is a really old lake, estimate about three million years old, and it used to be at least five times the size of what it is today. There's no outlet out of Manyara, making it very, very alkaline, very soda, the perfect environment for blue-green algae to live in, which becomes the food of these lesser flamingos. Every night, a female with an egg that's nesting in Lake Natron, that's about 100 kilometers north from here, will fly back there to feed her chicks. But in the morning, they will fly back here to come and feed. The species' prime source of food is blue-green algae that only grows in very alkaline lakes. 
Flamingos have filaments that hang from their beaks, and as they go along the water, the filaments filter out bacteria. The bacteria is what gives flamingos their distinct coloration. Right now, the flamingos are quite far off into the lake, so I'm, I'm going to try and take a canoe and, and get a bit closer to them. However, this lake is very shallow, and it, um, I, I might have to push the canoe quite a bit before it will float. See if we are stuck. Nope, there we go. I'm gonna head a little bit off to our right. Getting a little bit closer to these flamingos now. You can see that they you know they've been sitting here in the middle of the lake for the whole day, so their wings are stiff and they definitely seeing me and they're starting to spread their wings out and uh, getting it ready to fly if they have to. But it's interesting for me that um, they, uh, they are all in a band here. Maybe there's a soil change. We will find more blue-green algae. So uh, we're just slowly drifting in. They are looking at us into the sun, so we might be able to get slightly closer than what we would being on the other side. They're getting a little bit nervous of us coming closer. The sub-Saharan breed of the flamingos are the lesser flamingos. The name refers to their size. They're the smallest of the breed, but even still have an impressive wingspan of 90 to 105 centimeters. Back on the shores, Jean comes across another unique natural event that is brought on by the first rains. I'm on the shores of Lake Manyara and the sun is setting. And as the sun's going down, one can see this reflection of millions of strands of silk. And um, it's really interesting what it is. It's a uh, newly hatched spiders that's doing something called ballooning. So they, they would climb to the top of a, of a kind of piece of grass and just start to release silk. And as the silk gets longer and longer, eventually the wind just lifts up this entire spider and blows it away. And this is how spiders get distributed all across the world. And uh, a spider like this might end up in a thermal, taking it 50,000 feet into the sky and blowing it to the other side of the planet. It absolutely everywhere. And it's astonishing that one never sees these spiders, but all around us, are millions. There's one right here. And um, tiny spiders that's making their, their little bodies into a uh, like a ball and just kind of cruising through the sky. Wildlife expert and safari guide John Duplessis has arrived at the Ngorongoro crater. It's a spectacular volcanic caldera that was created over two million years ago when the Ngorongoro volcano erupted so violently that it collapsed into itself, forming a perfectly symmetrical crater 20 kilometers across and 600 meters deep. Today, the crater floor is home to the highest concentration of wildlife in Africa, including all of Africa's most iconic animals, like lion and hyena. It's also home to a number of Africa's last big tusked elephants. The big tuskers are older males drawn to the crater floor's many swamps. There is one elephant in particular that is of interest to Jean. The word is that an old male with magnificent tusks has not been seen in a while, and there are concerns that he might have died. This caldera is such an amazing natural environment and especially for old bull elephants, this is like a, a final retreat where they come and live their last days. And there's one particular bull that I would love to see. He, um, he's got the most amazing ivory, about 100 pounds aside. 
and it's a very rare sight these days to see these big bulls and especially big bulls with big big ivory. Um, there's been talk about the, the last remaining large tusker dying in the crater but recently someone said there's still one left so I'm, I'm off on a mission today and try, to try and find him. Africa's tusker numbers have been decimated by sport hunters who have targeted them specifically for trophies and by poachers who kill elephants to supply the illegal ivory trade. I'm driving to an area of a huge amount of wildlife and there's scattered bulls of elephants in between the wildebeest and zebras and we're getting going a bit closer now to see if uh, the big bull we're looking for might be in between them. ahead is five or six over here but quite a few more groups off in the distance and then some scattered lone males as well so I'll pull up here and start to scan them a bit because the best way to see them is to just stop and, and take your time and look through it. There's a lot of bulls down here with some seriously large ivory, but it's not the one we're looking for. That elephant we're after has ivory that's almost touching the ground and he's struggling to walk. He needs to keep his head up. It's extremely rare to see elephants like that and he likes to hang out in swamps. So we're gonna have to continue and look a bit more. However, these ones have impressive ivory as well. The Ngorongoro crater gives us a glimpse into what parts of wild Africa must have looked like 100 years ago or more. It has largely remained cut off and secluded from human advancement that has decimated wildlife across much of the continent. Jean is heading to an area where small rivers feed several swamps. It's a place he knows he's guaranteed to find old bulls. I'm at one of the major water holes in the crater and we found a great old bull elephant in it. And this is a great example of why elephants kind of make the crater almost like a retirement home. Elephants have six sets of molar teeth through their life and they gradually use those up as they grow old. And when they are between 55 and 60, they've generally used up all of their teeth. So it's very hard for them to live out in the forests and feed on things like bark and twigs and stuff. So they need to come down to places with swamps and soft grass and the crater floor is perfect for that with quite a few of these little swamps. Yeah, this guy's having a good old time feeding on some of this water lettuce. Yeah, it's, um, it's sad though that this is, this is where elephants start to decline, feeding on greenery like this does not sustain these huge bodies so elephants slowly decline from here and that's where the term elephant graveyards come from because generally elephants would die in swampy areas like this. And this morning we've already seen a huge amount of male elephant on the floor and I think that number is increasing the whole time as there's males on the rim of course that's getting older. Ngorongoro has resisted attempts to change it. At the turn of the century, German settlers tried to colonize the area and cultivate the crater floor. They tried to clear the area of all its wildlife, but it was a losing battle and they gave up and moved out. Ironically, it was because of sport hunting that the area ultimately won its conservation status. It became a protected area in the 1920s as part of the Serengeti Game Reserve. Now its healthy population of animals living their natural lives is bringing in tourists. Some feel that tourists coming through in vehicles is an environmental problem in the making. You know, and who said the crater is overrun and spoiled? Anything that is overrun with its animals. Here in this plane in front of me must be 30,000 animals of 15 different species. 
quite an incredible sight. There's very few places in the world where one can witness something like this. Night is starting to fall. Aside from the park rangers, no one is allowed on the crater floor. So Jean will make his way back up to spend the night at La Mola Camp on the crater rim. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis is in the Ngorongoro Crater, where he is searching for one of the last great Tusker elephants. Tuskers are elephants with enormous ivory, and they have been in steady decline in Africa because of sport hunting and illegal poaching for ivory. He is searching for one particular male, a legendary old and rare elephant with tusks so huge, it has difficulty lifting its head when walking. The elephant has not been seen in some time, and no one knows if it has moved away from the crater floor or if the great tusker has died. It's day two for Jean's search, and he is out early. Ngorongoro has a high population of elephants, but they are usually found in the montane forests above. There's a breeding herd of elephants on the crater floor, and this is extremely unique. In, in 20 years of working and being on the crater floor, I've never seen females and calves right here on the, on the bottom of the floor, sometimes on the edges of the forests. But to see them on the floor is almost unheard of. They are very nervous. They, they are running from side to side, and any vehicle starting up and any new noise obviously scares them and they change direction. It's not an uncommon thing to see elephants on, on open plains like in the Serengeti, but that would be a matriarch that, that knows the area. She's been there many times, and her confidence trickles down to the rest of the herd, making them all feel confident. This is completely the opposite, where they're all nervous. They all have their trunks up the whole time, smelling, trying to take in new scents. This matriarch has never been here. This is gonna be a tough day for them, and I hope they eventually find their way to the west of the crater where there's a nice forest with fever trees. So uh, at the moment, they're still out on the plains. They've calmed down a little bit, and I think they're also really tired. Jean will keep an eye on this group. Hopefully, they will find their way out. Jean decides to move to higher ground, where he has a better vantage point and can scout for the tusker. On his way, he comes across a pride of lions. Like most animals in the crater, there is unique behavior here among predators. An average lion pride's home range in the Serengeti is about 200 square kilometers, but that's not possible here in the confined area of the Ngorongoro. There have been as many as six prides at one time within the crater's 260 square kilometers. And by the look of these two, they will add to those numbers. It seems like there's two mating pairs in this pride of lions, and you know, it's interesting looking at this pride here, I am not seeing any cubs. So it is possible that a takeover happened here fairly recently. Basically, when males take over a pride of females, they, they would do something that's quite rare in the animal kingdom, it's called infanticide. It's killing all the cubs that does not belong to them. And by doing that, they ensure that they will mate with these females and raise their own litter. Those, the females that would have lost their cubs will then go into estrus all at the same time, about three months after the takeover. So the males will mate with them. So generally, all the cubs inside a pride will be the same age. Unlike the Serengeti, where lion territories and territorial males change often, shaking up the gene pool, the crater population has remained static, which has led to problems at times. Inbreeding has weakened the genetics of the population. Lions have an interesting hierarchy. The females do a lot of the hunting and raise the cubs. Once the cubs are born, it's the male's job to keep the prides intact by defending against roaming or nomadic males. If the dominant males lose or are killed, the nomadic males take over the pride 
and kill all of the cubs. So Mother Nature has come up with a unique solution. Quite hard for females to conceive. Reason being is that uh, so many males might come through and try and mate with them. Uh, sometimes this pride of males will be with another pride of females that they are dominant over. And if a female hears an estrus and there's a nomadic male that comes through, he can get quite aggressive and they will actually mate with him, but they will not fall pregnant. So when the actual dominant males mate with them, they need to do that and mate about every 20 minutes for five days. It's estimated that there's about 1,500 copulations for every cub that reach one year old. The number of predators an area can support is directly related to the amount of available prey. Unlike the Serengeti, where much of the prey species migrate through a predator's territory for a short period, in the crater, the populations are resident and fluctuate very little. That makes for a more stable food source. Because of the high number of animals, the crater floor can support a large variety of carnivores. There's a really nice pack of hyenas over there. And the crater floor must be the ideal environment for hyenas and certainly one of the most productive hyena environments in Africa. It's actually a misconception that hyenas are these massive scavengers where here on the crater floor, they would hunt at least 70% of their food themselves. Strange enough, lions will scavenge quite a bit and quite often one would find lions chasing hyenas off kills that they've made. And the way these hyenas will hunt would be by basically running something tired. They've got such amazing stamina. It's that construction of tall front limbs and short back ones. They've got a very economic gait and they can go for hours. And um, they would find a wildebeest and stick behind it for hours until that wildebeest can't move anymore and then kill it. Looking at the number of hyenas versus lions we've seen over the last couple of days, it's, it's kind of clear to me that the hyenas is winning this race right now. It's a really nice group of hyenas here with a lot of young pups. It's pups of different sizes and ages. And there's, a, there's two females, it's probably from the two of them. Within a hyena clan, there's a lot of jealousy and competition because of a hierarchy. The pups of the dominant female or the alpha female will always be under attack by lower ranking hyenas and their pups. Hyenas also have extremely rich milk so that enables a mother to go off and hunt, feed, and potentially stay out there for a night or two before she will come back and feed her cubs. And the cubs will survive just on the milk that they drank before. This uh, female off here to my right is a little bit bloody. She might have been in a fight or they might have made a kill last night. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis is in the spectacular in Gorongoro Crater. He's searching for an old tusker elephant that some fear may have died. He's an important animal, one of the last few remaining big tusked elephants that remain in Africa. While Jean has been looking for the elephant, he has come across two of the most prominent predators on the crater floor. As Jean is watching the hyena, several of the animals with blood on their fur head off into the distance. This can only mean one thing. The hyena are feeding on a kill. This is one of the coolest sightings I've seen in many years. It seems like what happened was these two male lions must have chased a buffalo. They didn't quite kill it, and it went for refuge in the water and died there. These hyenas must have seen what was going on, and now they are literally diving under the water, completely submerged, to take mouths full of meat. These two male lions are just lying on the edge, kind of basically looking at their food, going for the hyenas. 
lions, and hyenas. Normally, the two species battle over food and often steals each other's kills. But Jean finds the two species showing some unusual tolerance for one another. While Jean has been focusing on the situation between the lions and hyenas, something incredible happens. This huge elephant we've been looking for the last couple of days just walked right through the scene. I mean, where in your life have you seen something like this where you have these hyenas in the water, two male lions, and this the biggest elephant in the crater, and probably in Africa, walked right through this picture. It's, um, it's incredible. Got the most amazing tusks. This must be one of the largest elephants remaining in Africa, and especially the size of his tusks. They are well over 120 pounds each, and perfect symmetry. It's um, very, very rare to see an elephant like this, and there must really only be a handful left in Africa. And this is one of the last of a kind. The gene of big tuskers are getting less and less, and it's going to be many years before elephants like this are out in the wild again. The crater is just such a perfect environment and place for these old males to survive and get old. All around the edge of the rim are observation points where rangers are looking into the crater and making sure that no poaching happens. And it's kind of been like this since the early 1900s and poaching has been really, really under control here on the crater floor, allowing huge elephants like this to become old and massive like this. This old elephant may be the last of a dying species. For decades, elephants with large tusks have been killed for their ivory. Scientists believe that with the big tusk gene being eradicated, elephants are now being born with smaller and smaller tusks. And it's possible that one day, we may see elephants with no tusks at all. For now, though the Ngorongoro crater formed more than two million years ago remains a refuge for the old tuskers and their offspring, its geology has made a barrier that has allowed animal species to survive and thrive, giving us a glimpse of what Africa may have looked like if human populations had not moved in and demanded greater and greater resources, putting its own survival ahead of these truly magnificent species.